everybody. Um, today we're going to be talking about algebra in the Renaissance, and this is part three. So I don't know exactly what's gone on in the other videos, but um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the solutions of the cubic and quartic. And some of the mathematicians we're going to be talking about are Del Ferro, Fiore, Tartaglia, Cardano, and Ferrari. So first, a little bit about the Renaissance in general, and this happened um, between the 14th and 17th century in Europe, um, and there was a reawakening. Um, there, people were creating and discovering very quickly, and it was a time period that was defined by a combination of rediscovering classical literature and philosophy as well as a rebirth of culture, art, and politics. So it's kind of an overhaul of the entire Europe. Um, the Renaissance also produced a number of famous people, including artists, scientists, philosophers, and obviously mathematicians. Um, a few of their names might ring a bell. Michelangelo, Raphael, Galileo, Copernicus, Donatello, Da Vinci, etc. Um, and there are more mathematicians like Descartes or Copernicus and the few that we saw on the previous page. Um, so I want to talk specifically also about math during the Renaissance. Um, so Italy was especially impacted and before the Renaissance Italian merchants didn't need to know much besides how to determine costs and revenues. Um, so the Renaissance expanded their businesses greatly to the point that the merchants were able to stay home in Italy while they hired others to sail off and buy and sell in their place. So now at this point, merchants needed to know how to make deals, finance capital, arrange letters of credit, draft bills of exchange, and make interest calculations. Um, and double entry bookkeeping, which is basically the idea of recording both debit and credit for a single account, like you would see in a checkbook. Um, that became a good way to track the constant flow of goods and money for um, merchants. And we can kind of see that the economy of barter was slowly being replaced by the economy of money that we have today. So the Italian abbasists were created out of a need for more mathematicians. And we can see they're a new class of mathematician. They had vigorously studied Arabic mathematics, which emphasized algebraic methods, and schools were created for the express purpose of teaching merchant sons the necessary mathematics. They would um, use the mathematical textbooks that the abbasists had written. Um, they were super, super essential in teaching the new Hindu Arabic decimal place value system and the algorithms for using it. And initially people were pretty hesitant and um, didn't really like the idea, um, but the new system required only pen and paper while the old system required a board and counters. And so the new system was just less cumbersome. In addition to being less cumbersome, um, there was a decrease in the cost of paper and the increase in the availability of paper. So that was a huge factor in its popularity. Um, mathematical texts were mostly practical. Um, they would mainly stick to teaching young merchants the mathematical skills that they would actually need in carrying out daily transactions. Um, so somewhat similar to our textbooks today, problems and their solutions were described in detail with every step carefully explained. Um, and as far as the recreational problems that were included, there were a variety of kinds. Um, they had geometry, elementary number theory, calendar, and astrology, to name a few. They didn't really focus on too many problems, if any at all, that lingered on problems without solutions, because obviously they wouldn't have a clear practical use for merchants, so they didn't include a lot of them. Um, some of the mathematically significant lessons were those that created algebra problems out of real life situations. Um, so I have an example here from one of the books. Example, a field is 150 feet long. 
A dog stands at one corner and a hare at the other. The dog leaps nine feet in each leap, while the hare leaps seven. And how many feet in leaps will the dog catch the hare? Assume leaps are made consecutively in the same time. So it was these kind of problems that led to the development in the field of algebra and the need for symbols with unknown values. So as you can see in the bottom right hand corner, we have um, some words and letters or symbols that were used to symbolize the idea of something unknown. So like thing is pretty vague, but that was basically their X. So that's what they used. So here I wanna talk a little bit more about the mathematicians behind the solutions to the cubic and the quadric equations. Um, and I'm gonna to try to pronounce their names in like an actual Italian accent. So you'll have to forgive me if I sound really offensive. Scipio del Ferro was born around 1465 and died around 1526. And he was the first to solve the cubic equation using radicals. He only solved um, one of the two cases. Um, and this was mostly due to the fact that um, they weren't using zero or negative numbers. So obviously that would create many distinct cases. Antonio Maria Fiore was born sometime in the 15th century and died sometime in the 16th century. Obviously, we don't know about, a lot about this guy. We do know that he was a student of Del Ferro, and when Del Ferro died, he was given his secret about the solution to the cubic equation. Um, he ended up challenging Tartaglia to a contest in 1535 to solve cubics, but he was outclassed. Um, and then Nicolo Fontania Tartaglia was born around 1500 and died around 1577. He was a self-taught mathematician and due to his extraordinary talent, he was able to teach in Verona and Venice. Um, he is famous for his algebraic solution to cubic equations and that was published as we'll see later in Cardano's book Ars Magna, which is Latin for great art. Um, and then among his various other literary achievements, Tartaglia was the first Italian translator and publisher of Euclid's Elements in 1543, which I thought was really neat. Okay, Girolamo Cardano was born in 1501 and died in 1576. And if this tells you anything about his character, one interesting fact about him is that he is reported to have correctly predicted the date of his own death, and he achieved this by committing suicide. Um, I would strongly encourage you to look up this man because he is very much a character. Um, he received his doctorate of medicine in 1525. He was a professor of mathematics in Milan, Pavia, and Bologna. Cardano lectured and wrote on mathematics, medicine, astronomy, astrology, alchemy, and physics, which is quite a big range. Um, his most famous writing, as we talked about earlier, Ars Magna, which was published in 1545, was the first Latin treatise solely devoted to algebra. It was a super important step in the development of algebra, as well as mathematics as a whole. Um, and it also included the solution of the cubic by radicals and the solution of the quartic by radicals, which were proved by Tartaglia and Ferrari, respectively. Another interesting fact about Cardano, he was imprisoned in 1570 on a charge of having cast the horoscope of Christ. Um, and this was a time in Europe, but in Italy especially, where the church was a super big deal and they were very much in charge of a lot of information that went out. Um, so for example, I don't know if you guys have heard of this, but the story about how Galileo suggested, oh, like what if the planets revolve around the sun? Like this seems to make the most sense. And they got very defensive immediately um, and, basically put him on house arrest 
you should really look up that story. But they very much controlled the narrative as far as scientific discoveries because they wanted it to line up with what the church said. Anyway, so in 1571, Pope Pius V granted him annuity for life, and then he settled in Rome and became an astrologer to the papal court. And then finally, Ludovico Ferrari was born in 1522 and died in 1565. He was actually orphaned at 14 and then sent as a refugee to Milan, where he was taken in by Cardinal and taught Latin, Greek, and mathematics. And he eventually grew in favor with Cardinal to the point that he would collaborate with Cardinal in research about the cubic and quartic equations and was able to find a method of solving the quartic equation. So now I want to take a look at the solutions. So here we have the solution of the cubic equation. And this is the algebraic solution. So it's very friendly, very familiar. So we start with ax to the third plus bx squared plus cx equals d. And we transform that into x to the third plus px equals q. And then using that's using the transformations x equals y plus beta and then y equals x. Then we define u and v by u minus v equals x and uv equals one third p. Putting that all together and using that initial equation x to the third plus px equals q, that gives us that first equation right, can you see my mouse? There you go, this first one. And so if we expand this um, equation and simplify a little, we end up with u to the third minus v to the third equals q. So using v equals p over three all over u, we substitute to get this equation up here. And then we simplify and solve for u getting this equation which is q plus or minus the square root of q squared plus four p over three to the third over two with all of that to the one third. Um, and we also then solve for v and then finally for x, which um, Cardinal gives the solutions right here, which I won't read because that's too long, but gives that solution right there. And I did want to say before we move on, I thought this looked um, oddly similar, or I think you can notice the similarities between this and the quadratic equation, which we all know the song for, um, the quadratic formula. I'm sorry, I misspoke. Um, so I thought the similar similarities there were interesting. So they do give an example. Um, x to the third plus 3x equals 4. And basically, they just plug it into this equation down here, and they get 1. Um, and then in Arsmania, we find the example x to the third equals 15x plus 4. And then using the formula, we get this right here. So Cardinal knew that there was no square root of negative 121. And he also knew that x equals 4 was a solution. So he was basically stuck. Um, he referred to such square roots as sophists and thought taking square roots of negative numbers was as subtle as it is useless. Um, so obviously, he was quite frustrated with his inability to continue after getting stuck. So this is the solution of the quartic equation. And they start with the depressed quartic equation, which is right here. And then that can be solved by, um, so they rewrite it and introduce the variable m. Um, so they regroup the coefficients on the power of y on the right-hand side. And that gives them this third equation right here, uh, which is still equivalent to the original equation. And then they want to complete the square on the right-hand side and get this equation. 
And then that simplifies and can be rewritten as this. 8m to the third plus 8pm squared plus 2p squared minus 8r all times m minus q squared equals zero. And that's our equation 1a. Um, and it's called the resolvent cubic of the quartic equation. Um, and so then they say the value of m may thus be obtained from Cardano's formula. And they get that the right hand side of the equation one, which is this one right here, where square root of 2m times y minus q over 2 times the square root of 2m, and all of that is squared. Um, and this bit down here talks about how if m equals 0, that would create a problem. Because we can see here, if we plug in 0 for m, 2 times 0 is 0. The square root of 0 is 0. And then 2 times 0 is 0. So then we would have q over, excuse me, q over 0, which is, it's never good to divide by 0. Um, luckily, however, um, the, at the time that Ferrari was working with this, they didn't really have a strong concept for zero or in fact for negative numbers. Um, so that wasn't even an option for them. So that eliminates that option. Um, but for us, we need to make sure that M doesn't equal zero. So then we um, simplify and equation one becomes this. And we see that the equation is of the form m squared equals n squared, which can be rearranged and factored. And then equation one is rewritten again as this big long guy. Um, and then using the quadratic formula that we talked about a little bit ago, they can write the four roots as this equation, which is set equal to y. Um, and therefore, we get the solution to the original quartic equation down there at the bottom. And that's it.